Ezekiel chapter 2 was the call of Ezekiel by God. Chapter 3, we continue the commission of Ezekiel. Remember, we learned the last time that he's going to be preaching. He was told to preach the word of God that spoke to him to people who are not going to hear. Moreover, verse chapter 3, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat thou, eat that thou findest. And this is a role we continue in chapter 2. Eat this roll and go and speak unto the house of Israel. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Here, I believe it's Jeremiah too, they're taking literal of eating the word of God. It should be our diet. Eating the word of God is exercise for your eyeballs. It's exercise to keep your mouth shut. It is exercise for your hands to turn the pages. It is exercise for your ears to hear the Holy Spirit. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. Caused him. A little bit of God put into there. Now, we've been studying as a family Genesis 1 to Ezekiel 3. And in the Bible, you notice a particular word that keeps showing up. Three-letter word called eat. 655 times in 583 verses, you see that word, just eat. Not eating, not eat, or anything like that. Just the word eat. And you realize that God warned Adam about eating and sin became by eating and study the word eat in the Bible. It's very, very interesting word to, to look at. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat. So belly is not, I mean, eat is not just, you know, through your mouth and down your throat. It's also your belly. And fill thy bowels, that's your insides, with this roll that I have given thee. Then did I eat it. And it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Jeremiah 15, 16 and 20, verse 7. So God gave the commandment to eat, to cause him to eat. And openly and willingly and knowingly, chapter, uh, verse 3, he eats. He obeys God's command. Whereas Adam was told not to eat. And Adam forbeared what God said. He said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them, not man's words. So have I said before, when I go and preach the gospel, when I go help the men at the prison, I'm going to have an open Bible. And I will tell you what I think, what I say, what I have to do. And I will read to you from what the Bible and if I'm going to quote a verse and I'm not sure I'm quoting it right, I will tell you verbatim or I'm not sure. But I think this is, I think it was that prophet. I think this book holds. But I can be wrong. But where I go with the word of God and it's open black and white or red and white, I can't go wrong. For thou art not sent to a people of strange speech and of a hard language. Now, to illustrate that for me, if God were to pluck me up and plant me in Poland, plant me in Afghanistan, or China, Japan, or Russia, that would be people to me that is strange speech and a hard language. I don't understand. I couldn't talk. I would have to have an interpreter. For me to speak to them and them to speak to me. And what God's telling Ezekiel, but to the house of Israel, the language you're going to speak, the ministry you're giving Ezekiel is called Hebrew. And you know it. And the people you're going to speak to are Hebrews. You don't need to learn a new language. You don't need to know Hebrew and Greek. I'm going to send you to an English-speaking people with an English-speaking Bible today. Ezekiel's not called to learn Greek. He's, he's already been taught Hebrew. 
not too many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. I'm sending you to your own people in Babylon. Now, there are a bunch of people right now where Ezekiel is. He's in Babylon. They're speaking a language that they don't know. And God is saying, don't go to them. Didn't Jesus often tell his disciples, don't go the way of the Gentiles. Don't go into to, to, to those people. He says, I've sent to my people with his language, the language that they spoke. They perfectly understand remarkably what Jesus said because it was in their language. Babylonians may not even understood what Ezekiel said, but the Jews did. And when you get to Ezra and Nehemiah, you got to understand that something has happened in the 70 years. They and their children have forgotten what the Jewish language was. Even probably in Jesus' time. The language of the Hebrews was probably dying out, but did not die. Surely I have sent thee to them, that's the Jews. They would not, they would have, wait a minute, take that back, hold on. Verse 6 again. Not too many people of strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou cannot understand. Surely I have sent thee to them, they would have not hearkened unto me. To them there are the Gentiles. He says, if I sent you to them, the Gentiles, they would not hearken on to you. Listen, Jeremiah, if you were to learn Babylonian right now, they're not going to listen. They're not going to understand. And I'm not sending you to them. I'm sending you to the Jews, who you can speak and they can understand. But to the house of Israel. You got it? Will not hearken unto thee. So they're no greater than the than the Gentiles. The Gentiles, if, if Ezekiel could speak the language of the Babylonians, they're not going to hearken. They're going to speak Hebrew to the Israelites, and they're not going to hearken. How would you like to, let's say a calling. Let's say somebody came up to you and said, you know what? You're going to be a baker. Your whole dedicated life is going to be for baking. And yet you're never going to make a cake and you're never going to make any bread. Nothing's going to come out of the oven. But you're a baker. That sounds kind of foolish. And yet Ezekiel's call of God is, you're going to my people, your people, you're going to speak my words to them, and it's going to be of no effect. How's that for a ministry? How's that for these big... Uh, glass, uh, podium, mega churches. When you get up there and speak my word, they're not going to listen. You know what you're doing, Ezekiel? You're warning them. You're telling them what they have done. You're backing Jeremiah up. You are the two or three witnesses of Jeremiah that prove that Jeremiah was speaking for me. You're speaking for me, and they're still not going to listen. And there's sometimes, you know, I have prayed. For some people for their salvation Lord you do whatever it takes and I have seen one particular person I have seen their life turn upside down and still have not relied on God and there are just some people you know what they're not ever going to trust God no matter what happens in their life and that's what the call of Ezekiel is Jeremiah planted the seeds Ezekiel's watering but guess what there's no fruit so you may go out knocking on doors. You may go street preaching. You may go passing out gospel tracts. You may go to work and sit down with an open Bible with somebody. You may do what the Lord has told you to do, but do not expect fruit. It may not come like Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And it may be possible through Jeremiah and Ezekiel because we learn Later on in a book called Daniel, Daniel understood Jeremiah, and Jeremiah never knew it. So you may get fruit that you never know. Every once in a while, a gospel track will fall on the ground, and I'll say, let it go. Well, aren't we supposed to be? No, you don't know what, maybe God wanted that thing to fall down for someone to pick up or for something. 
You don't know what a gospel track will do you later. You don't know what your voice has done in someone's heart later. You may not get the results now. You may never ever find out about the results now. God may allow you. I know personally of three people that I have four, five, six people that have that have asked the Lord to save them. I know there's more than six, but I'm not going to go notching my belt, then I'll get prideful. I support missionaries, a few of them. There's results and fruit from them that I'm not going to find out until later. You know, you take every one of these mega churches and these radio ministries. If God were to walk up to them and say, listen, you're going to be preaching to a bunch of people not going to listen. Do you think they'd be in that business today? You walk up to Joel right now and tell, hey, listen, no one's going to listen to you. No one's going to care for you. No one's going to buy in your book. Are you going to continue? You think he would? Ezekiel and Jeremiah did. And that's one of the things that people come up to me, my family. Where are the people? Where are the results? I don't know. God does. But unto the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. Uh, Ezekiel, I was going to say Jeremiah. Ezekiel, don't worry about them not listening to you, because they have not listened to me. And Samuel said that when they wanted a king. God spoke to Samuel and said, Samuel, it's not you they rejected. They rejected me. It's not your pre you're too loud. You're too mean. You don't have no, it's not you. It's the word of God. Now, if I went on the street corner and, and cussed out every four-lettered word and every three-letter word that was filthy and abominable, okay, it, it's my language. It is my tone. It is my loudness. But if I get in there and say, You must be born again, for there is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. I mean, uh, the wages of sin is death. If I quote from the scriptures and I be loud about it, it's not me. It's God. I'm only confirming what the Bible says. Listen, those people are not going to be in church. A lot of funerals and weddings today are not being held in churches. You stop 100 people in Daytona Beach and ask them what the dial is for the Christian radio station. I say that in quotes. Here, I couldn't even tell you what the Christian radio station is. I don't think it's Christian. You think they stop and listen? Unless they have a mechanical failure on their radio, that's the only way they're going to stop. That would be the only way they would hear the word if you come knocking on their door. If you hand them a gospel track, if you leave a gospel track, or if you preach to them on the street, that's the only way they're going to hear. And it's up to them to do what they're going to do. You can't force them. And God tells Ezekiel, they have not listened to me, but I am sending you as a witness to what I have said, even though they're not going to listen. Sally, why do you preach on the street? They're not hearing you. They're not listening. But God said, go. And be known that it's me they have rejected and not you. For all the house of Israel are impotent, and that means shameless and hard-hearted. Read Romans chapter 1, and I forget what the very last verse says, but they have pleasure in doing it. Hebrews 11 says the, the pleasure of sin for a season. That's why your family don't understand you. They're lavishing in their sins and think it's fun. And, oh, you go to church three days a week and you pass out gospel tracts and, and you do this. You read your Bible. And they think it's dull and boring and stupid. And yet when you tell them about the Bible, what the Bible says, they don't hate you. They hate the word of God. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces and thy forehead strong against their forehead banging heads 
You think when somebody comes over, you're too loud. You think you know because someone criticizes what you're preaching or knocking on their door, giving they've done the same thing to Ezekiel. Fifteen hundred years later, they're still doing what they did in Ezekiel and Jeremiah's time. After their nation, after their city, after their church, the temple has been destroyed. After everything that Jeremiah has said has come to pass, they are still banging heads against God through his man. They bang heads with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There are religions out there that are still banging heads against Jesus. Even though when you open a Bible to them and show them, because their Bible doesn't say it's so. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Ezekiel is a lighter. That's what makes a, a lighter light to flint against that wheel. And the light that Ezekiel is carrying is not to light up a cigarette or a pipe. It's to light up God, Jesus Christ, who is the light, John chapter 1. The same kind of rock that God used to water Israel in the wilderness. That flint has absolutely no uh, uh, liquid or perspiration or water in it. It's the hardest and driest stone. That is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ and also a type of Ezekiel who is called a son, the Son of Man, who is also the title of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you read Ezekiel, you're reading about the Lord Jesus Christ. A type. Oh yeah, they received Jesus when, when, when he became the emergency room. He became the medic. He became the healer. He became the doctor. He took care of their lives. But when it came to him dying on that cross, where were they? Fear them not. Why would God have to say that if there would be no qualifications to come up to be feared? Neither be dismayed at their looks. <laughs> at the looks. You know, they start rolling the eyes at you, start making faces at you, start giving you certain gestures. Though they be a rebellious house. Now if God says that about his own people, the Jews, in captivity, after all the judgment, what do you think he's going to say about America? America has done everything that Judah has done. Now I just learned the other day, this, this, this Pompeii, Volcano that went off and the destruction and all that and there was just some things and there's a video I, I want to watch but it's it's perverted sexual thing but what they're saying just moments before that this volcano erupted that there was this uh, uh, festival and what this nation has done from time after time after time only shows the judgment upon Judah the judgment upon nations the judgment that's coming upon America you can't get away with your sins and think it's going to be happy-go-lucky for the rest of your life. That Pompeii city was filthy. It was disgusting. And that volcano was just a judgment of God. The judgment of God upon his own people was a city called Babylonia, with a king called Nebuchadnezzar, with burning and destruction. And what do you think America is going to be? She's ruined already. Moreover, now Ezekiel is going to be called a watchman. So are we. But we're going to classify this part of this chapter, and we're going to take it. It's not fully us. We can use it. The Bible is applied historically. Historically, Ezekiel has happened, chapter 3. Doctrinally is a, st is a statement to the Jews that, after they have been brought to Babylon, what their results are. Spiritually is when I can apply it to the Christian, but
but you can't always spiritually apply the entire context. You may have to rightly divide. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words. You can't have all my words in a modern Bible. They're added. They're subtracted. They're footnoted. That I should speak unto thee, receive in thy heart, not head. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. With the heart, man believes unto salvation. You better believe when, when you're witnessing somebody and they're going to confess Jesus Christ as their Savior, it better not be lip service. It better be heart service. And we're going to see later on lip service of, of Ezekiel. Lip service will come. And God will proclaim that these people have lip service, but they got no heart service. There are plenty of people out there who have lips said they've received Christ, and in their heart they have not. And they're going to find out that the judgment of God be, depart from me, I never knew you. But Lord didn't depart from me, I never knew you. You better be very careful when it comes to someone's soul and being saved. It better be done the Bible, Ray, and not your way. Study the heart with eating. And hear with thy ears, not with your mouth open. You can't hear with your mouth open. And go get thee to them of the captivity, the Jews that are already in Babylon. Unto the children of thy people, the Hebrews, the Jews, we, we just studied that early in chapter 3. Speak unto them. And tell them, thus saith the Lord God, you're to go to your people, speak to them, and you're to tell them, thus saith the Lord, and open up the Bible and tell them what God has said. And what's going to be the reaction? Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. God does not want the excuse, Christian, they're not going to listen to me. They're not going to do nothing. They're not going to get saved. They won't. Then the Spirit took me up. Kind of rapture. I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing. That may be the, that may be the sound of our rapture. Though, uh, as a twinkling of an eye, we may not even, can't even fathom what the rapture is going to be like for us. Boom, they went gone. Well, here we are, meeting in the clouds. We may hear a sound. Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touch one another. Now, we're not going to hear that. Remember, Jeremiah just, I, mean, I keep saying Jeremiah, we studied from 52 chapters for five lamentations. We just learned Ezekiel seeing these creatures. They're still there. They go up with, with Ezekiel. Ezekiel, not Jeremiah. We don't see the cherubim. And we're not going to see them in the rapture. Ezekiel does. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness, in the heat of my spirit. That's kind of odd. A little retaliation there by the man of God. Bitterness, is, is that a good word? In the heat of my spirit. Is that really good words? Uh, I went up in delightfulness and so glad. And that's not what it said. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. You know, at the rapture, there's going to be some Christians who are going to be bitter and angry. God, I didn't get to see the finish of the football game. I don't know who won. I didn't get to climb that corporate ladder. I didn't get to see the baby born. I didn't get this. I didn't get that. And I've been even told by a, by a good, rectable preacher, you know, that there was a song that put out there, just a little while, Lord, or wait a little while. What foolishness. You realize when, when we get up there in the clouds, you might find Christians there disgruntled and complaining. We haven't been to the see the Christ yet, have we? you imagine your smile, your pains are taken away? Great glory to God here. The next thing we're going to see is the Lord Jesus. What's your problem? I don't want to be here. Wow. What's more important than Jesus calling you? Let me finish my cigarette. I had a beer going. 
I had a big dinner. Wasn't letting me finish the dinner first. Then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Abed, that dwelt by the river Shebar, and I sat down where they sat, and remained there astonished among them seven days. After what just happened to him, it'd be something well, on earth happened. Did you get it? Ezekiel's raptured. Seven days later, he's sitting on the ground. Judgment seat of Christ. While there's a seven period going on. Job sat on the ground seven days. And it came to pass at the end of the seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Now we're going to learn what a watchman does. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth. A watchman is to hear the word of God. At God's mouth, not man's. You better have the right Bible. Because if you got a man in the pulpit quoting from a modern Bible, that's not God. That's Satan. That's man. That's education. That's somebody has got something on the wall to show you. And give them warning from me. You want to be a watchman? You go to the people after you heard the word of God and you warn them. It doesn't say save them, does it? Now you can scream for a vast population of people to hear you. As much as you can say to the cashier, here, I'd like to give you a gospel track about the Lord Jesus Christ that you can read on your time. Or you can put in a letter to somebody you want to write a letter to. When I say, who said? Who's the I? God. Now watch. God speaking now. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. And thou givest him not warning. Nor speakest to warn the wicked from his, from his wicked way. Do you realize before you go speak to the people with the warning, God has already spoken to them? Go out. Anybody in Daytona Beach... Ask any hundred people, what's the cemetery for? What are they going to answer you? We're dead people. God has already spoken to man, you're going to die. Now, what are you to warn them? What happens after you're buried? What happens after death? Not about the great tribulation period. Not about the, the four creatures we, we read about in Ezekiel 1. Not about how many animals were in the ark, where Cain got his wife, or any philosophical or any theological study that you can find in the Bible. And there's a ton of them to study. And there's many interesting things to look at the Bible, how Jesus fed the 4,000, and blah, 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 blah. What are you going to do with a lost man? God has, already gone, God has already told him he's going to die. Most fear death. What do you got to warn him? Can't you just preach a little love? Excuse me, miss. Can you tell your husband to preach just a little more love? Is there love after death? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and my wife are going to join up together. Didn't Jesus say we're going to be as the angels so never give him to marriage? So you can rule that out. There's even stuff you can tell a Christian about death. You're going to face Jesus Christ. Just because you're saved, you know, you, know, you can earn eternal rewards. You can earn crowns. But God has already spoke to them. And thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. There it is in verse 18. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. You don't want to die as that. 
That's what you should tell him. He's going to die in his sin. What happens when he dies in his sin? What else is there else to talk about? When you're dealing with Wall Street. There's no time for magic. There's no time for face pain. There's time to preach about hell. There's time to teach about you're going to die. What are you going to do before you die? Why do you have life insurance? Why is it called life insurance when it's paid upon your death? But here's a wicked man. He knows he's going to die. And if he dies, he's going to die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thy hand. Now, I'm sorry to say, I am very sorry to say, when I stand in the audience of the great white throne judgment, there are going to be people who are going to be cast off to hell, and their blood is going to be on my fingers. I'm sorry to say that. There are too many people that I have not witnessed to. There are too many people I told God I didn't want to witness to. There are too many ways that I thought about after I saw the person how to witness to them. You can't just say I don't know or I'm not going to do it and just think, okay, oh well, once I pass the judgment seat of Christ, all will be done. I'll lose a crown. We'll be due, oh well. As you see these people who die in their iniquity at the great white throne judgment. The tears are not wiped away to uh, Revelation 20 or at least 21. If the tears are not wiped away into, into 21 or 22. And the great white throne judgment is in Revelation 20. What do you think you're going to be doing at that great white throne? When mama, papa... Son, daughter, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, that that boss you hated, that co-worker, that you would be offended to speak Jesus. Listen, I'm preaching to myself too. How about that person that God told you give a give a track to him? I ain't had that yet. I had that happen to me yesterday. I didn't do it. Specifically, God said, give that person that gospel track, and I didn't do it. I may never see that person again, but my, their blood is going to be upon my finger. I didn't warn them. And I'm a street preacher. And I try to leave a gospel track out every day. And I have failed. Ezekiel 3.18. Many, many times. And the Lord tarries, I have probably failed many other times. Am I a sinner? You better believe I'm a sinner. And I am not saying that boasting. And I'm not saying that happily. There are some people's souls that are going to go to hell because I didn't do something about it. The only thing worse I can say for that is someone going to hell making them thinking they, they were saved by your mouth and they weren't. I think that, that would be the only worst thing. Yeah. Thank God for that. Yeah. If thou warn the wicked, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. And he turned not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. He shall die in his iniquity. Where does he go? He goes to hell. But you warned him. What street preaching? What's door knocking? What's gospel tracks have to do? What's those bumper stickers have to do with anything? But thou hast delivered thy soul. If a man at the great white throne judgment goes off to hell and you tried some way, somehow, for them not to go. Nothing happens to you. There's no blood. There's no tears. Maybe tears because if it's a family member, I, I would assume. But I'm saying as far as guiltiness. 
You are guiltless. You are sinless. You tried. Listen, I have been witnessing and I have been praying for one person since the day, the day after I got saved. 1987, you figure out how many years it is, it's 2015. I have done my part. I'm still doing it. Again. Now, 20... In 21, we got to be careful. Again, when a righteous man doeth, doeth, I hate that word, doeth, doeth, turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I requite at thy hand. We are in the Old Testament. Here's a man who did right, did what he was supposed to. He died. He died in sin, and he goes to hell. <coughs> Old Testament. Old Testament. Old Testament. You can do right all your entire life at that moment before you die, commit a sin, and die and go to hell. In the Old Testament. Old Testament. You heard me. Old Testament. How can you apply that to a Christian today? You know a man who's saved, who's done right, he got saved, who's not walking right. Try to help that guy get back. Don't you dare as a preacher say, oh, I'll just let him go. That's one of your sheep. Don't you as a Christian say, oh, he just went out. That's one of your brothers or sisters. Try something. Because look what he says. But his blood will wipe from quite at thy hand. You don't try to warn him. As a Christian, when that guy stands at the judgment seat of Christ, it is at loss. You're at loss. I think it's Jude. Uh, let me go to Jude. I think it's Jude. Revelation, John. I believe it's Jude. It says, uh, that's what it's saying, but that doesn't have anything to do with his, with his content. I must be thinking something else. As Christians, we're supposed to support, help, cry, laugh, pray for one another. And when we see someone start falling by the wayside, we're to help them. You know, the Amish people in Pennsylvania, you know, when, when, a, when one wants a barn to be built, the entire community spends a day and helps that guy to build his barn. Yeah, but as Bible-believing, born-again Baptists, when someone starts falling, by the way, we get on the telephone, we start rapping the the the, uh, the rumor lines. We start speaking against them. That ought not to be so. He's gone away. He, what happened to the person? He's gone. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that he, the righteous that the righteous sin not, and he doeth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, and also thou hast delivered thy soul. You, as a judgment seat of Christ, you help another Christian do right. Guess what you get? You get part of his labor. Listen, when a wife's got to stay home to take care of the babies. And she encourages her husband, listen, go knock on doors. I'm okay. You go tell someone about Jesus Christ. That wife is going to get the benefits and the rewards that part of her husband got for doing the Lord's service. Now, when you have trained up a wife, and you're in a grocery store, and you get what you need and all that, blah, 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 and you turn around, and your wife's passing out gospel tracts, The people say, let me tell you about Jesus, let me tell you about Jesus. Listen, that's a joint reward. That's something to be happy about. 
You better take part in that joy in the Lord. And the hand of the Lord was, was there upon me. And he said unto me, Arise, go forth into the plain. And I got Genesis 11, 1 through 3. And I will there talk with thee. Then I rose and went forth into the plain. Behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, as the glory which I saw by the river of Shebar, and I fell on my face. And the Spirit entered into me. Now that's something that's remarkable. I don't know if that's ever happened anywhere else in the Bible. Usually the Spirit is in the Old Testament. The Old Testament. Old Testament. You got me on that? Old Testament. Usually the, I think the Holy Spirit does not enter. Usually he comes upon but here it's remarkable to think that the Holy Spirit enters into Ezekiel. You know what the baptism of Jesus Christ, the Spirit rested upon Jesus, not in? After the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, receiving Christ as your Savior, you get the indwelling Holy Spirit, as Ezekiel gets here. And set me, up, set me upon my feet, and spank with me, and said unto me, Go, shut thyself within thy house. House arrest is in the Bible. But thou, O son of man, behold, they shall put bands upon thee, handcuffs. Ezekiel, here's your commission. What's the first thing going to happen, Lord? They're going to handcuff you and give you a house arrest. <laughs> Isn't that a great commission? <laughs> I just want to go out and serve the Lord. Do da, do da. And shall bind thee with them, and thou shalt not go out among them. You're not going anywhere. And I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of their mouth. You're not even going to be able to speak, Jeremiah. I, mean, I keep saying Jeremiah. I'll get Ezekiel by Ezekiel 40. Then when we get to Daniel, I'll be saying Ezekiel. I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, and thou shalt be dumb. What is the meaning of dumb in the Bible? You're not able to speak. So when you call someone dumb because they're not smart, you're dumb. By opening up your mouth when you shouldn't have opened up your mouth. Because opening up your mouth means you're dumb. I mean, you're not dumb. In the Bible, dumb means you can't speak. And shall not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. Luke 1 20. Now, Jeremiah, I did it again, excuse me. Ezekiel, I want you to go to these people. I want you to tell these people. I want you to speak my word. Yes, Lord. All right, what's going to happen? They're going to handcuff you. They're going to give you house arrest. All right, Lord, what's going to happen? I'm not going to make you be able to speak. Ooh, wait a minute, Lord. You want me to tell them? But I can't go out my house, and then you're going to make me dumb so I can't tell them. It, doesn't God have a great commission for his preacher? For they are a rebellious house. The reason why you're going to be locked up, Ezekiel, and the reason why you're going to be dumb is because of the house of Israel. You know why you may have that pain and suffering in your life? Because it may be somebody else. Then we read that in Jeremiah. This guy comes around, breaks the wooden uh, yokes off Jeremiah's neck, and he says, You know what? I'm going to make him iron. And that guy got killed before the year's out, and yet God says, Because of that idiot, I'm going to make it even worse. I don't, that's one thing I don't like about God. I don't like suffering, and I don't like suffering for someone else's example. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ suffered for my sins. How's that for example of Jesus Christ to Ezekiel? Ezekiel is going to suffer because the rebellious house of Israel, the type of Lord Jesus Christ. Your pain or whatever it is you're going through might be for someone someone else's I don't know what. I can't even fill in the blank. Your endurance of what you're going through may lead someone else to keep going. Or it may be a testimony to the rebellious house that, hey, you're serving the Lord and you're not. And that's the case in your life. You're going to get a reward for doing right, so keep doing right. But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth. How do you like that? 
God is not going to allow Ezekiel to speak on his own. The only way Ezekiel is only going to know a way to speak is when God looses his tongue and puts the words in his mouth. How's that? I wish God do that to me. I wish God would have me to shut up when I need to shut up and speak only when he wants me to speak. But the problem is my big flapping tongue, James says, is an unruly fire and can't be tamed. That's another sin I got in my life. My flapping tongue. Now, if you ain't got sin, you ain't got a tongue. The next time someone tells you, well, I don't sin. Open your mouth and say, ah, yeah, you do. I see it right there. What? What do you see? I see a tongue. Open up to James and show him about the tongue. Now, I'm sure your, your tongue has at least offended your spouse at one time. If not your boss or co-worker. I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord. We're going to read. Thus saith the Lord God. You know what you're supposed to do when you open your mouth? Better be, Thus saith the Lord God. Anything else is... You know, Jesus said, Every idle word you speak, you're going to give account thereof. The word of God is not idle. He that heareth, let him hear. So some people are going to hear what you said. He that forbeareth, let him forbear. Some people are not going to listen. For they are a rebellious house. <laughs> Isn't this a great way for a commission? Some are going to hear. Some are not going to hear. And it's a rebellious house. Over and over. Ezekiel, you are going to a rebellious people. Ezekiel, you're going to a rebellious people. Some are going to hear you. Some are not going to hear you. That's his great motivation. And yet, that's 2015. And Lord, uh, Lord willing, Saturday morning, Lord willing, it's going to be the people we're going to deal with. There's going to be the people you're going to deal with this week. You're not alone. Show me an example of what you're doing in the Bible. It's all through the Bible. People didn't get results. Jeremiah didn't get no results. Ezekiel didn't get any results. Did you, did you read the end of Mark? Why did Jesus get mad at the disciples at the end of Mark? They had three witnesses that he arose from the grave, and they still didn't believe three witnesses. And, and the, the two men that wrote it, that's four witnesses. And yet he kept telling them over and over in their life, they're going to kill me. They're going to despitefully abuse me. And when I'm risen from the grave three days, then you'll see me in, in uh, I forget what, Galilee. And you know what, Lord, can we sit on your throne? Lord, who's the grave? They were so paying attention to themselves. And then when, they, when Jesus did rose from the grave, they didn't listen. And even one, hey, we saw Jesus. 12, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. at least 15 people have seen Jesus since then. And one guy says, well, notice I put my hands in his prints of the nails and the, the hole of his side. I'm not going to. What? Where are your followers? I'm not here for followers. I'm here for the word of God. I'll let the Holy Spirit do the work. 